in. Welcome everyone to the NIU Art Museum's virtual panel discussion this evening of fantastic stories, freaks and feminism beyond gender myths in art. I'm Stuart Hen, the Art Museum's education coordinator, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and introduce our moderator this evening. A few notes about this presentation. This Zoom event is being recorded so you can rewatch or invite others who are not able to join us live tonight. The video will be uploaded to our events page after it's been formatted for web viewing. To minimize interruptions, everyone's been muted except our moderator and panelists this evening. Feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll help moderate those at the end of the presentation time allowing. Programs of the NIU Art Museum are sponsored in part by the Illinois Arts Council Agency through federal funds provided by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Friends of the NIU Art Museum, the College of Visual and Performing Arts season presenting sponsor, Shaw Media, and the NIU Arts and Culture Fee. Tonight, our conversation and discussion is moderated by Kristen Myers, professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at East Carolina University and deputy editor of Gender and Society. Some of you may recognize Professor Myers, who was previously a professor in the Department of Sociology here at NIU and served as the director of the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality until her departure in 2019. Myers was a 2018 NIU Presidential Teaching Professor and a 2017 recipient of the Wilma Strickland Award from the NIU Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. Professor Myers' research interests include race, ethnicity, gender, sexualities, feminist theories, and intersectionality. Storied reference, our exhibition is on view at the NIU Art Museum until February 26th, and portions of the exhibitions are viewable in a virtual format found online at niu.edu forward slash art museum forward slash exhibitions. I'll post the URL in the chat. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce and turn our screen over to Professor Myers. Thank you, Stuart, and um, I'm really so happy to be here, and I'm so happy that I can be here um, virtually, and um, really emotional about this. I'm, uh, I'm moved by these pieces of these artists that we're going to discuss tonight, and also I'm so happy to see you people, some of whom I've loved so dearly and haven't gotten to see in so long. So thank you, thank you, Joe, for inviting me to do this kind of really cool thing I used to get to do all the time and don't get to do anymore. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our uh, wonderful panel um, of artists tonight. And Stuart is going to sh um, forward as I indicate to him. Um, so we're going to start uh, by, let's see, my screen is doing crazy things. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Sarah Bielski. Sarah Hello. Bielski, is it working? Uh, did, did you hear me? What did you say? I just said hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> Let me tell them about you. Uh, she has an MFA from the State University of New York at Stony Brook after earning a post-baccalaureate degree from the Art Institute in Chicago and a BFA from Michigan State. She's been an art professor at numerous universities in Michigan, as well as the University of Southern Indiana, and most recently at Georgia Southern University. An award-winning artist, Bielski's work has been recognized by more than a dozen art coalitions. She has five publications. Her work has been exhibited in 47 national and international group shows, as well as solo shows. So she's gonna to talk to you about her work in a minute, but you're getting a preview here. Our next panelist is Johnson Bowles. Johnson Bowles received her MFA in photography and painting from Ohio University and a BFA in painting from Boston University. She's exhibited more than 80 solo and group exhibitions nationally, including a solo show at my alma mater, Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina. Feature articles, essays, and reviews of her work have appeared in more than 30 publications. She's received the National Endowment of the Arts Houston Center for Photography Fellowship, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Visual Studies Workshop. In 2020, more than 55 works from her most recent body of work, Veronica's Cloths, were selected for publication in 28 art and literary journals across the US. She's written critical essays for After Image and curated more than 12 exhibitions of Chinese, African, and American art. Next, let's see. My screen is a bit frozen. I'm sorry, more than 25, 125 exhibitions, my screen froze. 
pardon me. Um, our next artist is Patricia Constantine. Patricia Constantine is a native Floridian. She has an MFA from University of Cincinnati and her BFA from Kendall College of Art and Design. She's currently a professor of illustration at the Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was the co-owner co of Coda Gallery. Her work has been exhibited both in solo shows as well as group exhibitions in galleries across the country. In 2017, the New York Times wrote an article titled, How a Quirky Art Prize Tied the, to the DeVos Family Went Political, spotlighting her piece, Sin Eater, which features Betsy DeVos, Donald Trump, and herself as the Sin Eater. In the article, Constantine says, am I gonna back off because the DeVos family donates a lot of money to the city and her son founded Art Prize? What would that say to my students? That gives you a sense of who she is. The next uh, panelist is Rana Erdang. She earned her BFA in painting from the University of Nebraska. As she explains on her website, which is lovely and um, has lots of quotes I had to pull from. Erdang has a varied and interesting career. She's worked as a typesetter, museum gallery attendant, apprentice dot etcher, and journeyman color separation artist on high fashion catalogs in the graphic arts industry in Omaha and Phoenix. Her bio reads, since leaving academia, the patriarchy and pseudoscience behind, some things are folk tales or misbelief, her ingenuity has flourished. Erdang has won dozens of awards and honors for her work, which has been exhibited all over the country. She's the founder of Flagstaff Feminist Art Studio. Erdang recently presented her work titled Dark Lady in Part Social Justice on Virginia Woolf, Professor Von X Erased at the 29th Annual International Conference on Virginia Woolf. Welcome to her. And our last panelist tonight is Lauren Woods. Lauren Woods earned her MFA in painting from the New York Academy of Art, and she earned her BA in studio art from Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. She's currently an assistant professor of art in the Department of Art and Hi Art History at Auburn University. Her work has been shown in more than 40 exhibits since 2010, including seven solo shows. Among her numerous awards are a new faculty summer research grant at Auburn University and an Athena Standards Residency in Athens, Greece, which she won in 2020, but postponed just this summer, 2021. A woman of many talents, Woods is also a costume designer, and she was a principal dancer in the Mobile Ballet, Ballet Company from 2006 to 2018. A Vermont poet, Sarah Audsley, recently published a poem titled Field Dress Portal, based on Woods painting Field Dress. As you can tell, we have a wonderful panel of artists here this evening. So without further ado, let's hear them talk about their work. And we're gonna go in alphabetical, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So we'll begin with um, Sarah Bielski. And please let Stuart know when you would like him to forward um, his slides. Uh, am I responding, I'm sorry, am I responding to the uh, some of the questions in the email? Not yet. First, we'll um, just, Stuart, you're gonna show some slides, right? And um, just, you can give an overview of the pieces that you select, that were selected for the um, exhibit. Is that correct, Stuart? Yes, that's correct. I have a few, a few images uh, pulled from the exhibition and you're welcome to talk briefly about them if you want to reference them um, during your introduction uh, to the, the viewers. Uh, okay. This, the piece that's up, the two pieces that are in the show are part of a fairy tale series in which I try to dismantle the, uh, the idea of women in fairy tales as being asleep, drugged, unable to choose, indecisive, picky, oversensitive. Uh, so in that series, I have used some strategies uh, I used um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I've used Princess and the Pea, and I've used Cinderella. Uh, each one is, each title references, well, not each title as I'm looking at this. Uh, some of the titles reference the story that they're pulled from. This one, uh, Eight and a Half Medium is a glass slipper and it is freshly out of the packaging and it's my size shoe <laughs> and it uh it's clearly the 
well, clearly to me, the idea behind it was that uh, Cinderella ordered her own shoe. Uh, she didn't need to depend on the prince to bring it to her. Uh, and it sort of short circuits the male contribution to that story altogether. Um, and with too big, too small, just right, uh, after Goldilocks, the three rings bound up in a piece of blonde hair. The idea behind that painting was um, the fussiness of Goldilocks herself but replacing those bowls of porridge that were too hot, too cold, just right. The idea socially that we are as women and the typical wearers of engagement rings, there's a status attached to that. Uh, does the size fit you? Does it fit your socioeconomic status? What does it mean about the partner that gave it to you? Uh, you know, is he, is he well suited and, and what does that mean? Um, typically the flashier the ring, the indi more indication that uh, somebody of a high socioeconomic status gave it to the woman. And it's sort of a mark. I feel like it's sort of a mark that is put on your body to claim you and also socially advertise that you're taken and that you're taken by somebody with a lot of money, medium amount of money, no money. Uh, and that, that was the idea behind that one. Okay. Oh, Stuart, okay. So next um, up is Johnson Bowles. Is Johnson here? I hope so. Yes, I'm here. Oh, hi. Would you, hey. hi, nice to see you. Um, would you tell the audience a little bit about your pieces here? Sure. Um, I first have a question. Stuart, are you going to show all of them in the show or just a couple? I just showed a couple. Um, okay, so I'll just, so you have three or how many do you have? I have three. Okay, so I'll just tell you when to switch because I'm sure. just going to read a statement. Okay. And so if you want to go back to the first one, we'll just uh, start there. Are you ready? Okay, so while this body of work is not about a particular religious canon or belief system, the series takes its name from the St. Veronica's legend. It is said that Veronica wiped Christ's face with her veil during his journey carrying the cross. The image of his face miraculously left an impression on the cloth. The series Veronica's Cloth explores the residual nature of physical and emotional trauma in a contemporary context of my experience as a woman. The works represent flashes in the mind's eye and suggest an untold drama of violation, loss, anger, grief, and shame. The images are photographs from details of paintings and other objects displayed in museums. These details taken out of context suggest clues to a more complex narrative drama and beg the question, what happened? I'm searching for truth and seeking healing from what haunts me. Each work is a collage hand sewn on a vintage handkerchief in a manner purposefully pointing to that which is grandmotherly, grandmotherly, wise, and reflective. The unexpected juxtaposition of familiar materials, emotionally charged, such as snake insect. informed by my heritage as an Irish American practicing Roman Catholic and my beliefs in feminism, secular humanism, and social justice. Writings on phenomenology, ontology, homology, and semiotics provide theoretical underpinnings.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Patricia Constantine. Hello. Um, so uh, I am very much influenced um, by the circus, by sideshows, uh, freak shows. Um, I grew up very close to the William Barnum and Bailey uh, summer or winter home, excuse me, uh, located in Sarasota. And um, I was born and raised in St. Petersburg. So um, these are mostly the sideshow banners that you know I saw growing up and I'm still very attracted to that kind of experience of performance and you know misdirection and and all of that but I think that <clears throat> one of the main things that I that I do in in all of the the pieces that I do is I'm 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 uh, revising these narratives to uh, you know show the the uh, women are the heroines. They're not, uh, you know, they're not just objects or, uh, you know, we're not just sort of looking at them for their performance value or anything like that. But, but definitely, um, you know, they, they become much more empowered. So, so they're pretty large. I use patterning uh, behind them. They're watercolor with charcoal and pastel on top. Um, and I usually use my image um, in almost all of them uh, so far. And the reason behind that is because I am, um, you know, talking a little bit about or referencing, you know, freak shows, sideshows, and, um, you know, in reading a lot of material about that and growing up around uh, people, uh, you know, who lived in Gibsonton, which is uh, sort of the home of the freaks, that's their, their city, their home. Uh, and, and recognizing that they consider themselves freaks, but unique. Um, and what I am saying is I am also unique. Um, there's not a normal, normal, but I try to uh, revise uh, uh, these sort of implied narratives. Um, I'm very interested in myths and fairy tales and, and uh, horror movies from the 1930s, 40s and 50s, uh, Universal Monsters. Um, you know, I teach illustration, so I'm surrounded by, you know, students that are very interested in the narrative. So comics, uh, you know, a lot of pulp, uh, pop um, <clears throat> culture sort of enters into things in terms of, you know, reading, uh, I'm quoting different characters from Stephen King novels to, you know, uh, uh, Mary Shelley novels. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I'm constantly sort of infusing and, and pulling all kinds of things together because they really do support many of the same ideas. Plus they're, they have a social political edge to them, which, you know, in postmodernism revisioning, which is part of that really had a lot to do that. You would sort of revise an existing image like folks focusing on a political or social issue. So that's definitely something that happens in these. So, um, um, and I'm hoping that, you know, my, that there's something that I'm communicating. There's something that makes me feel empowered. So I hope that it makes others empowered or at least a question having things that they connect with. I definitely have a sense of humor. Um, and so I, I like having that come through as well. Thank you. Um, so next we have Rhonda Erdang. Well, back in, uh, it was about 2015, I was invited to a show um, at the Fox Theater in Tucson, which was built in 1930. And I went into this uh, theater, it was just magnificent. Uh, and when I came home, this is what I made. Uh, um, and I, I wanted to mention that um, I found I find a very um, strong connection for some reason to the historic Egyptian theater 
in DeKalb, Illinois, which I've never been to, uh, which was built around the same time, 1928 to 29. And uh, somehow I feel some kind of subconscious connection to it. Uh, I would love to go there and to see what I would make after being inside. I don't even know if it's open anymore with the COVID, but I would really love to go there. Um, but um, I deal uh, with uh, the subconscious. I like to um, go to sleep and uh, I feel that my hybrid images are formed when I'm sleeping. So my work has a lot to do with dreams and uh, nightmares. I live here at 7,000 feet in Flagstaff. Uh, we have a little um, observatory that was built by a man named Percival Lowell, who's a world famous astronomer and uh, his uh, little spooky um, mausoleum is up on the top of the hill here at 7,000 feet. And uh, I've been up there and uh, it's, it's very spooky. But what I'm trying to say is I'm constantly barraged with the ghost of Percival Lowell, uh, who was very mean to his wife. Uh, <laughs> he actually had a mistress. They lived in the mansion up on the hill and uh, they had to share the, his mistress and his wife, who I don't think he really liked, had to share the same, the same mansion, the same bedrooms, the same garden, the same rabbit in the garden. And uh, so, um, I don't know, somehow my uh, artwork responds to uh, this really strong male patriarchy. So you see a lot of feminist, feminine mythos in my work. Um, if we go to a next uh, picture, uh, oh yes, this one. Uh, I was uh, doing some work with the silent film stars and the face here is Theta Barra. I believe it's a face from 1917. And then this is what happened in my studio with Theta Barra who I just thought was such a beautiful woman. Um, I really had a lot of fun with this. Um, my, my narratives come from my unconscious and uh, this is what happened. I love long gloves and uh, the lingerie and the lace and uh, just anything that is beautiful. And what is the next uh, picture? Oh, and um, here up in Flagstaff, it's a very historic old town. And uh, I think back in 2015, when I was really poor and didn't have much money, I would rummage through thrift stores. And this was a poster, a large poster, that I thought was very beautiful that I found at a um, some store along Route 66, probably an antique store. And I probably got this poster for a couple dollars. And then this is what I turned it into. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, it, um, it's very gendered with the, the strong hands and then kind of uh, the Madonna thing going on. Um, uh, I, I love the hands and the faces. Uh, to me, it was, was really fun to make. Um, Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. Oh, I, back then, I don't think I, um, I noted what this famous painting was, but I believe it was of Spanish origin. Uh, I can see it down here to the, the lower right with the crown and the, um, the red cross. So I enjoy using a lot of symbols, symbolism. Uh, this is a copy of uh, one of my old books. I collect old and rare books. I love old things. And um, when I was young, my mother used to take me to antique stores in Nebraska. She was an antique nut. She just died December 30th from COVID. And um, 
what I'm trying to say is that an artist, I'm interested in psychom psychometry or uh, the paranormal and it, how it relates to, to me as an artist and what I create. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of people don't believe in psychometry, but uh, I happen to, and that's probably why I'd like to go to the Egyptian theater in, in DeKalb and see what happens. That's about all I have to say. Thank you, Rhonda. It is pretty, you should go. Randy posted a little update on the Egyptian. Thanks, Randy. Okay, and Lauren, tell us about your work, please. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I wanted to uh, say that I'm really honored to be in the company of these artists and scholars. Um, I'm just going to read something really quick. Um, my creative research explores the concept of mythic time and theatrical environments. Artworks become a space to examine notions of gender, sentimentality, desire, power, beauty, death and embodied expression, personal myth, both in terms of subject matter and what it means to be a female artist is developed across various mediums, such as painting, video and dance performance. In my painting practice, I am contemplating the character of the quote unquote genius male artist that permeates Western art history. Do you wanna switch the slide you can? Um, in the act of embodying an archetypal history painter, I intend to work outside of the structure of linear time with formal choices suggesting that works could have been created synchronously with historical figurative paintings and just found today. Through this intentional communion with the visual language of historical European painting, I aim to bring a contemporary feminine perspective, subtle humor, and empathy into the forms and gestures of classically inspired figures. You can change to the next slide. Some specific imagery and themes I explore include the reclining male nude through the feminine gaze and experience, women as archetypal hunter in control of her destiny and the world around her and envisioned environments inspired by the atmosphere of the theater where nature and magic can coexist. Thank you, Lauren. So now we're going to um, have a, a little bit of a Q&A led by me, and then we'll open it up to the um, audience, who I'm sure have a lot to ask you. Um, so we did title this uh, panel, uh, uh, this event, Fantastic Stories, Freaks, and Feminism. And so we'll start with um, the, the concept of fantastical stories, which includes many genres of storytelling, including Shakespeare, ancient texts from various religions, including the Bible, Greek myths, um, and fairy tales. And you've all done work representing one or more of these genres. I feel like you've already introduced us to what led you to your work on that genre in your initial opening. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the dark stuff. So today's, you know, fantastical tales as told by Disney bear only a modest relationship to their origins, which were put on paper by men like Hans Christian Andersen, John, P John Batista Basile, J.M. Barry, and Jacob, Wil Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, the Brothers Grimm. These were often dark and even gruesome, you know, including torture, mutilation, and murder, uh, most, mostly of women, often by other women, you know, the entire jealousy among the the older women and the younger women, et cetera. So thinking about your pieces for this exhibit, um, how do they address the sort of darkness, if at all? And and I'm not sure how you we should go about this. I, you know, you may not all have an answer to some of these questions. So if you do, um, uh, we'll just go for it. And of course, the next one is how do you address the light? Would anyone like to begin? I can I'm call sure. on you. Yeah, go I, ahead. I, Great. I, Thank I, you, I, Patty. I, I'll go. Um, uh, actually, uh, thank you for sending the questions in advance. It was kind of nice to be able to, to uh, you know, sort of refine some of my thoughts. I, I tend to be all over the place, but I was thinking about the, the um, uh, myth of Medusa. So, um, 
and you know the idea that uh, uh, this uh, sh um, there was jealousy from you know uh, one of the female gods, and so she turned Medusa into this horrible monster, who uh, you know whenever she would gaze at a man, he would turn to stone and then die. Um, she of course could Medusa could stare at women and um, <clears throat> they would not die. But there, there's, there's kind of this re-spin on this, and it's not just me, but there's a couple of other um, things that I've read where they're, they're talking about, yeah, you know, it was, it's not great that, that, you know, Medusa kind of got in trouble. And she got in trouble because she, well, she wasn't supposed to have sex, but she did, you know, in this other goddess's temple. So, you know, she kind of broke the rules, um, whatever that means. Uh, uh, but uh, she, you know, so she, she gets punished this way, but in, in a, in a way, uh, the, the idea is that she no longer, or a male gaze could no longer control her. In fact, if the male gaze uh, was happening, well, the, the male would die. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting if you start thinking about it from another from another viewpoint um, or, you know, the idea that, that what was really bad was that, that male gaze. And, and in fact, she did just have sex. It was, you know, usually um, uh, discussed that it was a rape, not, not, you know, not consensual. So I, I think that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Anyway, when I, when I looked at that story and I thought, oh, you know, I don't want it to be, I want Medusa to be like cool, like, you know, that's great. I mean, that, that would be really awesome to just like look at somebody and like turn them to stone. Um, uh, so, so I decided that I would do my own version of Medusa and I was looking at Caravaggio's Medusa and sort of use that as a, as a, as a base and, you know, um, I got some, not real snakes, but images of snakes and then sort of put some, well, you know, old white, Republicans in, you know, the mouths of some of these snakes. And it felt, you know, uh, again, empowering. So, you know, sort of turning that idea around, it's not, you know, it's still dark and I like dark, but it's not just, oh, you know, bad women getting pissed off at each other. It's, it's actually maybe bad men getting their, um, what they deserve. So, so anyway. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I, I go ahead. Be happy yes. to say something. Hey, so uh, I think yes, I I do use a lot of things that are dark in my work, but they're more lurid than dark. But I think about the nature of other as invoking fear because it's not something which can be named or categorized or put in the dualism of um, kind of a, a patriarchal viewpoint that is uh, male or female, right or wrong. And that it's really about the fear of the other that you can't name. And so my work really has to do with questioning the performance of gender and what, what that means. And sometimes if uh, a woman doesn't perform her gender, then it can um, be fearful not only to women but to, to men who maybe subscribe to uh, a heteronormative or a, um, a stereotypic role of a woman who cannot lead, cannot make choices, cannot um, be without reflecting, uh, again, as um, Patty was saying, the male gaze, but it's also reflected in how women see themselves and then become fearful of a, a woman who doesn't perform that gender. So that's what I think in terms about using dark imagery or dark materials that are fraught. So that, that fear of the other body, which I know you're gonna get into later, but it, it all relates uh, to something that evokes terror and phobia. You know, like for me, it's snakes and insects and things like that. 
cockroaches. Yeah. cockroaches you you and Patty both deal with some snakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. I, I appreciate that calling out the duality there. Go ahead, Lauren. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was just saying I can see some similarities thematically with the performance and gender also in my work. Um, I guess I'm going to talk about light and dark with mine. I, I'm kind of contemplating ideas of power and vulnerability through this veneer and expectation of prettiness. And so it's like purposely pretty, which usually isn't taken seriously, but at the same time, like you're saying, it's expected. Um, so, so it's kind of a veneer for something darker and deeper under the surface. Yeah, that's what I, I love about your work, Lauren, too, is that you're playing with, with um, um, allure and attraction and repulsion all at the same time and how beauty can lure you in to think about something else. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, mine, mine just are not terribly dark. They are ironic and, and playful. They're very uh, light. Yeah, sure. one-liners. So I'm sorry, I don't have much to contribute to that. No, no, but I mean, you literally are playing with light, you know? I mean, like well, painting glass, like, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> Rhonda, do you want to say anything? Are you good? Oh, You're good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All righty. Thanks, y'all. Okay. So now we're going to attack the freak here. So the term freak has long been used in dehumanizing ways to police, erase, and control bodies that violate normative standards and expectations of bodily form and function. As disability studies scholars like Rosemary Garland Thompson explain, Eli Clare writes that freak shows demonize and subjugate, quote, odd bodies for some people's profit and for other people's entertainment. Fantastical stories and parables are full of freaks, right? So the Hunchback of, of Notre Dame is the most recognized, but there are others that come to mind, Dumbo the Elephant, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, The Beast. Uh, these are all stories centered around them uh, about those characters redeeming themselves in the eyes of those who judge and ostracize them. So it's a long lead up, but I feel like it's important to lay the groundwork for this contested concept. And the question is, how does your work explore and our interrogate the specter of the freak? Whoever would like to start. Well, oh, Lauren, go, go ahead. For it. You can go ahead. I'll go after you. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I, I, I really pretty directly um, uh, approach this subject. And again, um, part of mine is I'm, I'm not saying that there um, isn't some truth to this, what, you know, what's been written about um, uh, taking advantage of or, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, putting people on display just because of, of what they look like. But I, but I also have to tell you that coming from another side of it where um, these people that consider themselves very unique were able to make a living. And when sideshows and carnivals were shut down, and again, I mentioned that city, Gibsonton, there was a lot of anger because they no longer had jobs. They could not uh, work independently. They, you know, so, so, and, and again, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, this is, this is really, you know, uh, this was all a good thing. I'm sure that there, there was a lot of abuse and things like that involved, but there were also a lot of people that were making their living um, and by choice. And that was taken away from them. And I, and I know being around uh, 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 um, uh, a lot of the, the entertainment um, industry in Florida and, and hearing the people involved with that uh, talk we're very upset by that, and we're we're actually financially hurt by that. So I think it's important to read and research that. And it's one of the reasons why I've, I have I've read I've tried to read a lot, and not just sort of base it on my own, you know, um, memories of um, you know people I knew and and my surroundings. But there's a great book called Freak Show by um, Robert Bogdan, and um, he you know th these are interviews actually with people that have been in the carnival and then, you know, the showman and, and, um, and talking about, uh, you know, talking about how that term 
is used. And um, it's, it's like I said, it's one of the reasons why I, I use my own face. Uh, there is not a normal. That's one of the things that um, uh, people that are unique usually talk about. When you suggest that something is normal, then, you know, like, what is that? And, and who's making that decision and who has that power? And the fact that we all are an other, we all are unique. We all have something um, that makes us different and unusual. And those things are not bad. They're not ugly. They're not monstrous. Um, they're not dark. And uh, so I try to put myself in that um, position and, and look at that. I'm not, you know, it was interesting sort of hearing um, uh, 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 Lauren um, talking about her work and I was thinking, wow, you know, that is kind of um, fascinating. How, like, how are you viewed? You know, and as a woman, you are objectified and you, you kind of want to you know, you're, you're trying to like primp and, and, and look good for something. And I, and I have to admit that as a 64 year old woman now, I'm not really sexualized in the same, in the same way. And I'm laughing there, there's this big sort of sigh of relief, but at the same time, the expectations I think I had as a younger woman were, were really, you know, frightening in, in, in a lot of ways. And so when I make some of these images with my image and I think about putting myself um, in, in a what might be considered a monstrous uh, a pose or image or you know action. Uh, I, I like doing that. I like being able to be something that I really want to be rather than something that I'm expected to be, if that makes any kind of sense. But, but it, is, it is a very um, it is a very interesting, I think, uh, uh, thing that we need to discuss, you know, and be uh, um, more educated about. And, you know, working with people, uh, um, you know, working with students uh, that, um, you know, there's, there's not a, uh, just one way. I have to, I'm the teacher, I'm supposed to find out what that student's needs are and what they're, you know, they're telling me to do. So I guess I, I, I really feel like, you know, I, I want to kind of get that across. We are all unique. We are all individuals. We're all freaks and we need to really, you know, respect that and not sort of do that separate uh, separatism or whatever, but sorry, I'm going on and on here. Well, I mean, essentially related to your work and, and I think you do like um, you juxtapose like power dynamics in it as well. Like the whole DeVos thing and the Trump thing. And like, anyway, you know, I'm a fan. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to take this one? I do want to say a little in. bit yeah. about the idea of like the norm and like the bodies and everything. I'm a, my primary thing I teach is figure drawing and I'm really trying to figure out a way to, like I was classically trained and you know proportions and things being a certain way and I'm trying to recreate the uh, what is it like pedagogy or whatever to not be like that to reflect more you know articulating pretty much what you're saying about everyone has their own body type or whatever as more the norm which is kind of the off you don't want to say a norm but like all our differences is what's normal, <laughs> I guess. So yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> well, I definitely have a lot of celestial images in my work. Uh, perhaps because uh, I go out a lot in my hot tub at night and look at the sky. That is like my favorite thing to do. Um, and interestingly, uh, let's see, in 2000, um, 18, I think, 17 or 18, I made a 78 inch long handmade book about Virginia Woolf and her lover, um, Vita Sackville West. And uh, they, um, they did a lot of stargazing together. They actually went to see the total solar eclipse on June 29th, 1927. 
Uh, this was in Yorkshire, United Kingdom. Um, I think uh, stargazing is a very important aspect of my life. It uh, makes me feel that uh, I'm very insignificant. And uh, the sky and the constellations really, and the moon, which shows up a lot in my work, really does bring me a lot of comfort, I guess, as a female. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Kristen? Go ahead. Yes, please. So, you know, and speaking about the freak, you know, I, I think the where I come to this is not presenting an image of the freak for objectification or um, uh, judgment or observation, but what I'm trying to do is show you what the freak sees and how it feels. And so I try to be very careful about that, um, that viewpoint of, do I show what happened uh, as the freak or do I say how it feels to be the freak and to be the ostracized? And so I think that's, the, that's a really difficult um, position to be in terms of an artist. Do you tell the story so it further victimizes or do you show it and show what happened or the feelings in a way that it evokes empathy rather than pity, right? So to me, the nature of the freak is from the point of view and who has the power to speak and who has a voice. So, yeah, that's I like that idea of empathy with a figure. Hmm. Although, you know, I, I will say, I, I, I think that is, that's really good and, and yes, we need to, you know, think about those things. I guess I'm, I'm not, it's not empathy for me. It's, uh, you know, again, it has a lot to do with empowerment that I'm, you know, uh, uh, I'm okay with this. Um, in fact, it gives me a certain amount of leverage. Um, because you're having a hard time looking at me. And again, this is coming from some of the readings that, that I've done and, and uh, where, where people uh, that are involved in sideshows are actually, you know, talking that the, these are quotes, but I, you know, um, I, so I, I think that there's just a lot of room for um, us to sort of approach these things and have these conversations and bring, you know, empathy or, or um, uh, you know, um, questions uh, about, you know, what this is. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I also don't want to, you know, hide that away or make it seem like, you know, um, uh, it's some, uh, that they might be somebody that we should pity. They don't, uh, for the most part, pity themselves. And again, this is coming from reading things that they, or discussing things um, that they would discuss. I, was just at the Showman's Museum, which is just outside of Tampa, but it is a carnival sideshow. It's where you buy Ferris wheels and, and um, uh, you know, the games and, and all of that. It's really bizarre. But um, uh, I went there because I wanted to interview some of the people because it is run by people that were, that were in carnivals, that were part of the sideshows, and they actually have um, you know, a little museum where they've got a lot of records and things in there. So I was able to interview and, and talk to a number of, of uh, uh, people and it, it was really pretty fascinating, but, and I'll hush here in a minute, but I kind of wanted to bring this back to, you know, when in teaching and as an illustration teacher, and I also work with the figure a lot. So I get that, but my stu a lot of times my students are dealing with things, but as, illustrators they're creating characters and a lot of times they're bringing um, not the perfection to a character but bringing other kinds of uniqueness I guess think x-men okay because they you know um, so it it I I really love that that my students are now sort of not seeing oh Cinderella doesn't have to be like perfect you know um, or the the you know why is she always like 
looking for, you know, Prince Alarming. I mean, this is like, you know, like forget The Bachelor, like, you know, just don't go there. Um, you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, I, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I love the new generation that's coming up. They're much more um, open-minded, broad-minded and very aware of, uh, you know, respect. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'll get off myself. I want to say one more thing about empathy with the figure. I guess I don't necessarily see it as pity. It's more like being able to place yourself in their position. And so I feel like that's something that we need like we need to experience. And I try to do that with my class with figure instead of us just objecting objectifying the model, like trying to actually understand what it feels like to do the pose and everything. So kind of taking that approach to it. Sarah, did you want to say anything about Cinderella being perfect? <laughs> well, she's perfect because she can get her own shoes now. <laughs> uh, the, I'm listening to you all talk about figurative. You all have the figure involved with your work somehow, and I, I, mine in my work, it's noticeably absent because I tell stories through objects uh, and still lives, but there. Are, the objects are things that people use. So the idea is to, I don't know, invoke the viewer to think about putting the shoe on, putting the ring on, um, to think about the things that they use with their body. Well, that's interesting too, Sarah, because they, your, your, um, your work really does reference the figure. You know, the ring goes on fingers. Um, the the shoe goes on a foot. Um, like one of the things that I was just, and this is just a side, but um, your work has a reflective and a reflection and a transparency that I think is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, when looking at some of these things from a female perspective too, like our reflection, what is our reflection? Am I seeing my reflection in that diamond ring? Is that really, you know, is that what's, you know, so important? Um, and then that glass slipper, um, it's reflective, it's transparent. Somebody can see through my clothing or my shoe. So I love the idea that Cinderella, yes, I buy my own shoes, thank you very much. And, you know, the, the Goldilocks, like pulling that hair through those rings, um, you know, it's, it, you've got the diamond ring, but you also have the gold of the hair, you know, I mean, it's, it's the, that kind of adornment um, becomes uh, powerful in a different way, you know, and, and I think that's really, really kind of fascinating about leaving the figure out, um, but just the, you know, sort of the negative space of where the figure was. Mm. That's a neat way to think about it. Thank you. Yeah, and going back to the the original um, fairy tale writing, like the Cinderella story and some of the originals, I think the stepmother cut her daughter's foot yeah. apart so it would fit into the shoe, you know, so it's all coming back together. Okay, let's move to feminism in the interest of time and, you know, empowerment. Um, so many of these fantastical stories pit women against each other, which I referenced earlier. Um, the the storyline offered centers around women's competition with each other, usually for the attention of men. Um, so being too plain or too old sends some women in these stories into murderous rages um, in order to control or remove the younger and prettier women. And this tension seems to reflect the ways that male authors view women and their relationships with other women. And it, that is probably fantasy as well. You've alluded to this um, already, but how does your work grapple with this real or perceived competition among women, if at all? Can I jump in there and answer that? Uh, I, I do, I'm the person that needs to leave at 6.30 or 4, 5.30. Uh, so I'll, I'll just try to answer this. Um, at least from the standpoint of too big, too small, just right, big diamond ring, medium diamond ring, big diamond ring, small diamond ring, just right size diamond ring. The competition that women have with rings, oh, let me see yours, oh, you know, trying to show it, flash it, you know, make sure people notice, keep it clean, 
uh, I think in, in addition to the things I said about rings from, a, from the masculine standpoint or from the male standpoint in terms of socioeconomic, socioeconomic status and uh, sort of a sign of ownership, I think women are comparing the rings to each other and that's not healthy to to sum it up in a in a not very academic way but there's there's um you know how big is yours it's our own version of how big is yours thank you anybody else yeah uh, um, may i Kristen? yes definitely so in, in sort of the power dynamic, I think what's problematic is pitting women against each other, right? I mean, that's what you're talking about. And then how in the power dynamic to not just please men, but also play the role, play the stereotypical role of, of passive, of needing help. Um, and so I think that it's fraught when a woman doesn't need those things, doesn't need men to tell them what to do, doesn't need uh, men to take care of them, to provide the answers. And I think a lot of women feel that way, that they want, they want that and they believe it, but to put themselves out there is also a position of, of vulnerability and fear. Of, um, of destruction or terror. Um, and so I, I think that that's, it's a very real thing and, and probably more generational sometimes. For example, when I talk to my daughter who's 26 and a gender studies, uh, a master's in gender studies, she looks at the world in a lot differently than my generation um, and how one becomes a leader Did we live? I think we might have lost Johnson. Sorry. Well, there so, she is. Cool. I'm back. But I just want to say that it, it, there's a generational view too to these things about women against women, or um, and how the roles play out. But I think it's a great question, and wish we had more time. So no, thank you. Running Kristen. short, but thank you. Anybody else want to answer that one? Uh, just speaking of time, uh, I got to go, everybody. I know, I know. It. Thank you for coming, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Great to and, see your work. And it was really uh, great to meet everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. We are um, running short of time. So I want to, I have a couple more questions, but I want to let the audience ask questions um, if they have them. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to unmute yourself, but... Um, you can give it a go. You can also type your question in the chat and I could read it. I'll give it a second. If not, I know I have, you know, I have more. Okay. Um, not seeing any coming in, but if, if they do just yell, I have one and I'll be quiet. I'll, I'll ask one last question. Um, oh, which one? Um, let's, let's end on a high note. So, you know, all of you were selected for this panel because you use your art to reclaim the power of women um, depicted in various ways. And rather than functioning as cautionary tales for the next generation, this exhibit seeks in part to change the narrative in an empowering way. How do you see yourself, um, how do you see your work as, as doing that, creating a, a, a piece that subverts or redirects a pervasive cultural narrative? Yes, I'll go. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Um, I think with my work, and actually the pieces I have in this year are kind of older things, um, but what I'm trying to do with my imagery and the way I paint is, kind of reclaiming like authenticity and like 
you know, making things that are true to myself. Because when I was in art school, I was always told you need to make things that are more serious and more realistic. And they didn't, these teachers didn't understand that the things that I'm making are part of my lived experience and things I've actually seen. You know, I was on stage from three years old to 33. So that was real to me. And for them to project their reality, you know, that was really frustrating. So I'm reclaiming my authenticity through my work. I agree. I, I mean, I think I love what uh, Lauren just said. Um, uh, you know, I'm an older woman and uh, I feel like I don't have to uh, um, please anyone any anymore except for, you know, uh, myself. And um, I'm going to say what I what I want to say, because, you know, um, what do I have to lose? Right. Uh, <laughs> And, fr and frankly, I would, I would welcome the dialogue. Um, I noticed that Randy asked a question that he wants to know what we're working on next. So I thought I would answer that and then let other people. Um, I'm working on a woman who's being sawed in half. And um, actually <laughs> it's uh, three-dimensional, it's boxes. And um, I noticed that a number of us are interested in the spiritual, the ma you know, magic, and which I, I definitely am in the whole performance um, thing, which, you know, Lauren's coming at that from a, a real, you know, a, a real, like she's performer understanding performance, but, you know, as, as I look at performance in, in the sideshows and from, from magic, <clears throat> uh, you know, and thinking about, you know, women sort of get chopped up in pieces and, you know, um, there's, there's all kinds of metaphors, but anyway, I'm working on a uh, woman sawed in half. I love that. Okay. Who can top the woman sawed in half? What else, what are y'all working on? Oh, well, let's see. I'm working on Frida Kahlo in quarantine with herself. Lovely. And it's a that is cool. Piece. I've been working on it for about six months and maybe I'll finish it this weekend but I just love the piece. <laughs> I'm really interested in the magic and the spiritual and the things that are hidden. Yeah. Because as a lifelong dyslexic artist who could never read or write, I have hundreds of books and I've probably never read any of them. Um, but uh, I've definitely been a black stain or a, uh, a scapegoat. So, uh, you know, that's how I view myself. So perhaps that's why the work that I do has a lot of hidden meanings. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? Um, I guess I will. Mine kind of goes um, with Patty's a little bit. <laughs> I'm painting, a, I've been painting a series of flayed deer with the like field dressed deer kind of as a visual metaphor for like um, sacrificial offerings, which kind of goes also with what Rhonda is talking about. So I'm interested in those ideas to mystery and magical things. Very cool. And, and um, go ahead, yeah. I, I, liked, I liked what everyone else was saying too, um, just to go back to, to what Lauren said about uh, earlier is you know the, the idea of pretty and um, and being criticized for in, being interested in things that are beautiful and and enchanting in that way and mine is kind of the opposite is being criticized for being too serious but um, and then what I'm working on now relates to some of the other uh, uh, women in the the exhibition and working on disembodiment and you know separating mind from body and um, what that means. Exciting. We'll have to do this again in a year, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in person. Does anyone else have another um, question? Yeah, Randy mentioned stargazing when Rhonda was talking and um, Lori says, thanks so much for discussion, all your work, it's very inspiring. I agree. 
And I know we're, we're out of time, but I wish we had more time. I've learned so much and I'm always inspired by hearing people talk about their ideas. And um, obviously I'm really like, I wanna buy it all. So <laughs> um, thank you so much. Does anybody have any final words? Stuart, do you have any final words? Just a quick closing. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening uh, for the conversation and this, this interesting discussion. If you're watching locally, the exhibition is open until tomorrow, February 26th. You are welcome to visit our website, uh, www.niu.edu forward slash art museum to schedule a free timed, masked and physically distanced admission. You can explore elements of the exhibition virtually on our website if you're unable to make it in person. Thank you panelists, Sarah Bielski, Kay Johnson-Bowles, Patricia Constantine, Rhonda Erdang, and Lauren Woods. A special thanks to our moderator tonight, Kristen Myers from East Carolina University. And thank you all for tuning in this evening. Join us uh, for future, future virtual events by visiting our website calendar posted in the chat uh, and look for our upcoming events. We have one tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, that's Central Standard Time. So with that, thank you again, Kristen, and I'll leave the closing thoughts to you. Oh, I just, I wanna thank you all for uh, doing this, sharing your work with everybody. I wish I could go see them in person. Like Randy says, they're so beautiful in person. Um, so I'm just really grateful to get to spend this evening with y'all and to learn from you. So thank you. And uh, yeah, Lauren asked for Instagram handles. Um, <laughs> post your Instagram in the, in the chat there. Um, so you can stay in touch with each other and see what you're working on. Um, and we do have websites for, for folks if you want to contact us and see links to the websites. Mostly you could just Google these names and you'll find them um, so that you can um, see the, the breadth and the depth of everybody's work, which is really moving. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you.